Hi, Michael. Uh, can you hear me? Hi, Khalid. Yes, I can hear you. I can't hear the other person. I see. Just I will try to. Yes, so there is a, some chat right now. Do you have? Do we can you hear me? Can you love life? Yeah. Do we have participants? I don't see. Um... Yes, there are some. I don't know how many. I, I could see that uh, just this is uh, some. I don't know. Just give me the second. I will try to. OK, Khalid, uh, sorry, I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I lost you briefly. OK, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so I'm going to go live now. So are you ready? Yeah, but we were looking at the participants. How many participants are there now? We've got um, 50 over. All right. All right. All right. So so. You want me to start? Uh, yes, please. Just give me a second. I'm going to click broadcast now. Just give me a second. Let me tidy up myself. Okay. So are you going to introduce me or I just start? I'm going to introduce you briefly. And so um, just give me a second. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Key Notions Health Innovation World. Um, our online experience with Mr. Khalid Shah. Oh, we're very honored to have him with us. Um, Mr. Shah, we'd like to briefly introduce yourself to our audience today. Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is um, Khalid Shah. I'm a professor here at Harvard Medical School. And uh, you might see that on my, on my um, first slide. I'm also the vice chair of the Department of Neurosurgery and direct the Stem Cell Therapeutic Center here and also the Center for Excellence um, in Biomedicine. So should, should I start from here or? Yes, please. Yeah. So as you see, the, the title of my talk, uh, you know, talk today is Gene Edited and uh, Engineered Cell-Based Therapies for Cancer um, at the Cusp of Innovation and, and Translation. So what I'll do, um, I, I have some disclosures first uh, about the, the two companies that I have founded uh, and I'm on their advisory board. Um, and also I want to acknowledge the people who have been in the lab uh, in my center uh, in the past um, few years and the years before um, over the last one decade and also the um, uh, collaborators within the Boston area and also outside outside Boston and of course the funding sources. Uh, so I want to start with innovation and, and how do we define innovation? There are different ways of defining innovation. And, and one of the key things um, in innovation is, is generating new ideas. Um, and, and, uh, and you can see um, Elon Musk and Steve Jobs and others who have defined this. But um, I think for us, innovation is doing something out of the box, um, something that you don't do incrementally, but that is, that is new, you have a bold idea. Um, it's risky always, but, but that's how we define innovation. And I think different fields might define it differently, um, but for us, it's something that is out of the box and is, not, um, is trying to change the status quo. And, and I think, um, this is uh, from the next wave um, world press. And if you look at all these um, innovative models at the business school and, and, um, and different companies, you basically have three different models of innovation. It's the, the first horizon, uh, horizon, second horizon, and the third horizon. Um, and they all define, so if you see the difference between the H1, H2, and H3, the three different forms of innovation, the one that is transformative is the one that actually peaks in the third horizon. Um, and then there is disruptive innovation, which is um, like um, Netflix, which basically had something innovative and then they disrupted that, they went all online and then it works for some time and then it becomes um, sort of, if you don't innovate again, at some later point of time, it will go down. 
but there is the the transformative innovation is always looking at innovation and it's all it's always going up that's the third third zone um here in in the transformative innovation um so i'll give you an example of the the london taxi drivers and i think what when we know when we talk about innovation um we um we somehow say well we have an innovative idea but i think the knowledge and technology that goes behind innovation is is essential and if you don't have any of that um the knowledge and you're not using the technology um you know uh, or you don't have particularly the knowledge you cannot influence innovation and, and one of the classic examples is the london cab drivers um you know before they get the license to drive a cab in london um they are given a strenuous test of understanding each and every and knowing each and every street um in london um and and once they have the knowledge they don't need the gps now they might have the gps but ultimately they are so knowledgeable about the the london streets that they can just do it without without gps and, and that's why uh, in london still if you have been to london um the cab drivers are prevalent um than the uber drivers um and this is and there there has been there have been studies um you know functional mri studies on these drivers and they have a specific part of the brain the hippocampus which um is very developed in these um uh, in these drivers because they have learned and they have memorized um the streets and i think you can innovate once you have the knowledge and i think uh, i'm specifically focusing on the knowledge here rather than the technology um and then the technology can drive innovation as well but in this case it's simple knowledge of of things that drives innovation um so our vision is basically um you know in the centers that i run it's translating biological therapies into clinical care and and i think um the key is the patient and and you will have realized yourself as being patient at some point of time that you have incredible knowledge as a patient as opposed to what uh, any of us had 20 years before when we went to the doctor uh, we didn't know much about the condition we had let it be cold or fever or anything now you can google everything and you might actually tell the doctor hey this is what i think i have and they are like i'm not sure so i think there's that tussle of the patient um why patient care has become important is because patient has become very knowledgeable and they ask questions why should i get this therapy and why shouldn't i get that therapy and 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 so also the the patient material over time has become so essential the tissues the that we use to sequence the pathology from the tissues and the lines particularly we get from for example cancer patients that are going that go back into the research areas so so as you see that patient becomes critical patient care becomes of of at most importance because it's pretty demanding and 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 patient material basically goes down to these core facilities here at the back base of the triangle and these actually form the the stepping stones for research areas like the clinically relevant mouse models in our case uh, for primary and metastatic diseases and then cell therapies for cancer we if we know and the targets on the on the tissues and the and the cells that we've gotten from patients we can actually develop therapies the critical phase is how do you actually translate these therapies into patient settings and there is the bottleneck and i'll outline those areas later what we have done to actually bridge that gap between um the the basic uh, translational research in the lab and how does it get translated into the field so i'll start with something um that we published um a decade ago on migration of stem cells so the red are the stem cells green are the tumor cells and um we published that the green the red stem cells migrate to tumors in the brain and then if we can engineer these red cells with therapeutics um that can specifically deliver um 
can be delivered at the site of the green cells. We can kill the green cells without killing the red cells. Now, over a decade, the technology has changed so much. We just published a paper last year, I think it was 2000, late 2018, on actually using cancer cells itself to kill cancer cells. So here, uh, the red is the tumor stem cell, but in this case, red is a cancer cell and green is a cancer cell. And in this case, the green is the repurposed cancer cell. Again, towards the end of my talk, I'll talk a little bit more about how we have repurposed these green cells to kill the red cells and then eradicate the green cells itself by in including a kill switch. But um, before I go, I just wanted, um, you to be aware of when we talk about cell-based therapies, there are basically, you can classify them into four two big groups. One is the allogenic and the other is the autologous. The uh, engineered stem cells and iPSE derived NK cells that are coming up now are in the allogenic um, category. Um, you can take them from one healthy individual modify them and put them back into the patient. And then there are the engineered cancer cells that I just mentioned to you and the CAR T cells. You will have to take them from the patient itself, modify them and put them back into the same patient. So you can understand, I, didn't, I don't think there's much more emphasis in the field on this. You can understand how, this, how critical this becomes because if the patient has only two to three weeks or four weeks, within which we have to treat the patient, then basically we cannot use these two types. Um, we have to go back to the allogenic type. But if the patient has three, four months where we can intervene, we can actually take patient cells, um, engineer them and put them back into the patient. So again, the choice depends on, on um, how, how and when the patient is to be treated. So again, I'll go back into this towards the end of the talk, but let me uh, go back to um, the cell-based therapies, the, the stem cell-based therapies that we have, uh, we have developed. And these are receptor-targeted therapies. Basically, we look at receptors on the surface of the cell, of the, of the tumor cell, tumor-associated endothelial cells, and now also um, uh, the immune cells. And, and we develop cell-based therapies, particularly the stem cells that target these receptors uh, by releasing ligands or antagonists that bind to these receptors. So we have bimodal um, molecules, we have uh, single molecules and with and without a kill switch, uh, one of them is interleukin-13, pseudomonas uh, exotoxin trail, um, EGFR nanobody in trail, thrombospondin-1 interferon beta. And then on the other side, this is our protein uh, we also deliver now anti-PD-1 and anti-PD-1 therapies via stem cells. On the other end, we also load oncolytic viruses into the stem cells. And oncolytic viruses like OHSB go into the tumor cell via nectin-1 receptors. So these are all receptor-targeted therapies that are coming from, from cell-based therapies. And we also, I'll talk a little bit about our car t platform. Um, that we're targeting EGFRV3 in, in the brain tumors. So I'll give you, um, I hope the video plays well, um, uh, about a green cell that is a stem cell releasing therapeutics and, and it's killing the, the red cells. Um, it will take some time, um, like 10, 15 seconds. This is a 54 hour movie, um, which actually tells you that the therapeutic that's released by the green cells is not killing the green cells, but it's only killing the red cells because they have receptors on the on the surface um, of the of the cells. Um, and 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 this is some kind of you know the drugs the half life is taken care of and the cell based therapies have that potential to do it. Um, so the question is that you know we've done this we've published 30, 40 papers using something. Uh, you know, cell delivered therapeutics locally, but the question always comes, how do we actually translate these therapies into the clinic? And so for brain tumor patients, where most of our work is, uh, we've looked at what actually happens in a brain tumor patient. So if somebody gets a brain tumor, they have two to three weeks before they get, they need to get, get operated to debulk the tumor. So the tumor is debulked 
and then they get treated with timazolamide and radiation. Um, and then ultimately the tumor comes back and these patients have 12 to 18 months to live. Um, so um, if you look at the MRI profiles of these patients with before the tumor was taken out and after the tumor was taken out, you can, you can figure out that, that there is a resection cavity because the cavity volumes are change as, as opposed to the total tumor volumes. So there is a resection cavity and the average cavity that we have calculated is 50 cubic uh, centimeters, um, 49 cubic centimeters, that, that's like a small bucket. And, and what we thought is, could we mimic this in, in a mouse model? Um, and, and, and can we actually identify why patients, um, why therapies are not working after, after patients are resected and given chemo and radiation? Why haven't we developed innovative therapies over years. We also know that you know, drugs given intravenously or intraperitoneally to patients don't reach the brain because of blood-brain barrier. So something has to change. Something, something really has to change in brain tumor patient treatment paradigm. So we've identified four bottlenecks, translatable preclinical models, because we don't think that there is um, there was uh, a preclinical model that would mimic tumor resection. Uh, delivery of, of cells, you know, we also noticed that, that, that you cannot deliver intravenously, intraperitoneally because cells don't reach there. And then the safety, how do we incorporate safety into our stem cells and then patient stratification? I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so we developed a mouse model, so hopefully the movie will work. It's similar to, um, to what you see in the patients. The tumor is taken out, this is the intact tumor. This here is the resection cavity. Um, and then this is the excised tumor. And, and then what happens is once you excise the tumor, um, you have the cavity created similar to what I showed you. This is the cavity that's created. So we thought, why don't we put our stem cells? But we, when we put our stem cells there, they get washed out. So we have developed this technology where we can encapsulate our stem cells in hyaluronic acid-based gels. These are called synthetic extracellular matrices. And shown that if you, um, if you put therapeutic stem cells there, uh, the green are the therapeutic stem cells, red are the remaining cells after tumor resection, and they survive longer um, with the gel than without the gel, and they um, have 100% um, survival benefit. Um, we published this uh, some years ago. Um, but the key to that was, can we develop uh, cells that have a safety switch in there? So we incorporated HSV-TK, which selectively sensitizes cells to ganciclovir, the drug, and can be utilized as a PET imaging marker using FHPG as a substrate. So we've shown that we have bimodal stem cells now, and they can actually, when we give ganciclovir in vivo, we can eradicate our therapeutic stem cells. So there's a safety switch, and we can actually image this by PET um, because uh, it, we can use FHPG as a substrate. Um, so moving on, there are other kill switches, which I'm not going into the detail. There's an ICAST-9 kill switch that we're looking in now. Um, and there's also a CD20 suicide gene, which has been used in CAR T settings and other cell-based therapy settings as a, as a safety switch. Um, so one of the key things, you know, as we know that tumor cells, uh, particularly GBM or other tumor cells, for example, if we take an example of TRAIL, um, only 40 to 50% of um, patients uh, are sensitive to trail. So we've developed this test now where we can actually take circulating tumor cells um, in the blood um, of patients and actually identify receptors on the surface of the tumor cell. So before we go into a particular patient, treat a particular patient, we will know the receptor status prior to the surgery from the from, um, blood samples that have circulating tumor cells. Uh, and we have now validated that, that the brain tumor shed um, samples 
in the um, shared cells in the blood that we can identify before we go into the patient. So then the, the protocol is uh, if the patient has a, a brain tumor, we can actually get the blood of the brain tumor patient, look at the CTCs uh, and see if they are positive for the receptor we have the targeted therapy for. We can, in the meantime, we have allogenic stem cells banked and we can actually plan. We don't, we need uh, 10 days to grow them in culture and, and place them in the tumor section cavity after encapsulation. So that's the model. And hopefully we're looking at a clinical trial early next year, uh, approval uh, from FDA. So we've gone back and forth with FDA and hopefully we'll have the approval for this. Um, so I think what I just told you, you know, and in between we have started companies um, and this translation needs bridging the gap between academia and industry. Luckily for us, we develop um, these therapies in the lab, and then we have a startup company that is actually taking this into the, into the clinical trials um, initially. And then if the big farmers are interested, they, they come in and they play. But I think this, this gap between academia and industry has to be bridged to make things to move things from lab settings into translation. Um, and whether you do it by a startup or whether you do it by collaborating with a bigger pharma, um, but there has to be an industry connection um, to your academic research to make things very translatable. So I'm going to switch gears into a little bit uh, immune oncology landscape now. And, and this, is, um, this is a chart from a major review drug discovery last year. And it talks about the um, significant increase in the number of immune-based therapies. This is talking about the data in 2018 again. Um, there's an increase of 67% in immune-based therapies um, in, than the previous year. And if you look, the majority of them are coming from cancer vaccines and, and cell therapies some from oncolytic viruses. Um, and, and luckily, I'll be able to tell you a little bit more about all these therapies um, that are ongoing. There are some other, um, you know, other immunomodulators like checkpoint inhibitors uh, and others, but I think the majority of it is cell therapies and cancer vaccines um, and, and some oncolytic virus and T cell targeted therapies. But that tells you the, the immense interest in, in cell-based immune oncology space. And, and, and th this is the data from um, 33 cancer types um, on 10,000 TCGA tumors to classify tumors as inert or immune active. And if you look at, um, so this C6 down here um, is the, the most quiet or C5 or C6, these are the, the most quiet. And among C1 here, uh, C2, these are the, the, the most active. Um, and the melanomas belong up here somewhere, but GBMs that have the lowest degree of T cell infiltration um, and the highest number of myeloid derived suppressor cells are immunologically very quiet. They are in C5 range. Um, and, and um, that tells you that, that treating a malignant GBM is incredibly tough um, because it's immunologically inert. So we actually, we had tumor resection uh, in, our, uh, in our lab as a routine um, sort of uh, lab investigation tool. Um, so we thought, let's look at what happens when you resect a tumor because nobody has actually looked at the resected tumor uh, immunologically. Um, and, and we resected the tumor and we looked at um, the, uh, in between while we were doing this, we also noticed that, that, um, that in the patients, when they took the tumor samples from different zones of the, of the brain tumors um, and, and as many of you might know that, that the, the microglia, the, the macrophages, there are two types. One is the blood-derived macrophages and one is the, the um, tumor-associated. 
And in, in, in the case of brain tumor, the, the tumor associated microglia uh, were mainly at the edge, at the leading edge. And these are the good microglia, maybe the, the M, M1s or M2s. You know. One is the, is the good one, but um, the, the blood derived that were in the perinecrotic zone uh, were, mostly, um, were mostly blood derived. So if you resect the tumor, we are hoping that you're removing the most of the blood derived uh, macrophages. Um, and then at the leading edge, you have mostly the brain derived microbia. Um, so, so when we looked at it, we took so we had to shift all of this into syngenic mouse tumors. And we showed that when you actually resect these tumors that are in syngenic immune competent mice, you actually have significant decrease in myeloid device suppressor cells and a significant increase in CD8 T cells and CD8, um, CD4 T cells. And then um, what we did is what I showed you earlier, we actually created um, immune modulatory stem cells expressing interferon beta, which is an immune modulator and, uh, and also a, a pro-apoptotic agent. Um, and and uh, when we place those in the tumor resection cavity, you get significant survival benefit in, in, um, in syngenic resected mice. And we're exploring this further with and without GMCSF and other immune modulators and with and without anti-PDL1 we should have more data on on the mouse um, mouse studies. But one thing is essential that you know when you do these cell based immune therapies, you have to do these in immune competent mice. And if you don't, you're actually not utilizing the full potential of the mouse's own immune system. Um, so I think um, again, switching a little bit of gears, if you look at the cancer immunity cycle. Um, you know, uh, there are seven phases in the cycle. There's the release of cancer cell antigens, there's cancer antigen presentation, priming and activation, trafficking of T cells to tumors and infiltration of T cells into tumors, and then, you know, ultimately killing of cancer cells. And you see at different parts of the cycle, different um, areas of the cycle, there's always, why isn't it working? It's a low mutation load, there's inadequacy here, and there's low local immune suppression. So there have been lots of therapies that have come out, um, like the chemo and radiation, they increase the mutation load. Uh, the vaccines, um, they, they prime and activate. Um, and then there has been, there have been CAR T therapies, which reduce the local suppression. Um, and, and, and these are the therapies that actually, um, you know, you can actually intervene in any, any part of the cycle, but I think local immune suppression is the key. And if you can go with CAR D therapies, uh, you can actually, uh, you know, in some cancer types is doing, um, it's working wonderfully well. And again, I've sort of, for the, some basic knowledge about CAR Ts, there is an ex vivo CAR T generation where you generate CAR Ts outside and then infuse it back into the patient. And there's an in situ CAR T generation where you generate CAR Ts, where you infuse the nanoparticles and then the CAR Ts are modified inside the patient. Um, but this is more prevalent and we've done some, some work. We've developed CARs. Again, I don't want to go into the details of the CAR construct, but uh, specifically for instance, an active domain, a hinge, a transmembrane domain, and then and the domain. Um, and then the key things, the key problems at this point, for particularly for difficult tumors like GBM, is that the, the CAR T therapies are not doing well. And we started, you know, somewhere, people started in 2016 doing it intravenously, and then we went locally, and now we are into, you know, intraventricular. Um, implantation of, of stem cells or CAR T cells in the brain that is that is working. But the bottleneck in all this is that the delivery is a huge issue. So we've developed our own EGFR V3 card that targets a specific um, receptor, EGFR V3, that's specifically expressed in brain tumors. Um, and we've shown that, you know, these are the, the green again are the CAR T cells. The red are the tumor cells. You don't see the killing in this, but I'm just give, giving you a feel of when you um, culture 
um, the green CAR T cells with the red tumor cells. This is how it looks like. Now, um, these are the two movies. They're not really great, but one is a control on the left one. The right one is CAR T's incubated with red tumor cells. You see they eat up the red tumor cells. Again, I think we have the interest. Um, let me just play this again. Um, the red um, tumor cells are eaten up by CAR T's, and in the control, you don't see anything happening. Uh, so we've delivered it locally and shown that systemically delivered again doesn't work, but if you deliver it locally um, in the gel, as I had mentioned, um, they, they uh, in intratumor it works well, but in the resection cavity, it works significantly well. These are very, very early data unpublished um, that, that we've gotten that maybe local implantation in the tumor resection cavity may be the way to go. Again, I'll switch a little bit of gears into oncolytic virus. The idea is to give you the whole plethora of what's happening in the cell-based therapies. And oncolytic viruses are, again, a new, uh, an old thing, but have been repurposed. They only kill uh, dividing tumor cells. Um, and, and the issue with them has been delivered. Again, can you go locally because systemically when you deliver them, they end up mostly in the liver uh, or the lungs and, and get eradicated, but can we actually, how do we go locally and, and make them sit? So people uh, have tried um, lo giving local injections in the tumorous cavity and there are a few trials that are ongoing. They do work efficiently, but I think that the viral load that you are creating locally is not, is not enough. So we have explored um, the stem cells. So what we are, what we tried is to put the virus, what you will see, a red virus into a stem cell. And the green, what you see here, are the tumor cells. And the virus will be produced by the stem cells. It will kill the stem cells first, but the stem cells will act as biofactories and then the virus will be transferred to the green cells. And ultimately the green cells will become red and they will die as well. But the robustness with which it kills um, tumor cells is incredible. You won't see any cell left behind. So basically what we are harnessing, we're harnessing the power of stem cells as delivery vehicles and local bioreactors in the tumor section cavity. So if you look at this image, so the red, uh, are the virus loaded stem cells and the green are the tumor cells. You see over time in 72 hours, um, the red cells take over all the green cells. This is in vivo, this is in the mouse. Um, and over time, all the um, green cells are almost red. And when they're red, they are destined to die. And we've done this in the resection cavity. And if you put a virus, live virus there, it's not there anymore, it gets, um, I think um, washed away by the cerebrospinal fluid in the blood, in the brain. But if you encapsulate um, the cells that are loaded with the virus and put them in the resection cavity, they survive longer and you get better survival benefit. We've also tried it in combination with anti-PD-1. As you know, that oncolytic virus infection um, increases tumor cell death and releases tumor antigens. Um, and then activates an immune system. And then um, you can actually, um, because it upregulates interferon gamma, which, which ultimately uh, results in upregulating PDL1 on tumor cells, and you can block PDL1. So we've shown if we can block PDL1 and also give oncolytic virus loaded stem cells, you get significant benefit in mouse models of metastatic um, brain tumors. So um, I don't want to keep you long. The last five minutes, I want to tell you something very exciting about our tumor cell story that uh, we believe that uh, tumor cells can actually kill tumor cells and could be um, a, a big new therapeutic. Um, this was published at the end of 2018, got quite a bit of press um, and New York uh, Times and, and Scientific American and, and other news outlets. Um, the idea is very simple. So um, the, what we know from if somebody has a breast tumor or uh, if you put a, um, 
memory fat pad tumor in a mouse, uh, which is roughly, a, if there's a one gram of tumor consists of a billion cells, uh, around a million cells will go into the circulation. They go out of the tumor, go into the bloodstream and try to seed elsewhere. So let's assume there's a breast cancer and it tries to go to pancreas and liver and brain and elsewhere. But the nature has created us in such a way that these cells do not seed there. They don't, um, the organs reject them because it's not their cell type. So these cells are so clever that they also go back to their own tumor. And what happens is that the tumor is leaky and they go more regularly to their own tumor and their tumor, because they are their own cells, they seed there. And these are the cells that are the mutant cells and, and, and give rise to heterogeneity of the tumor. Um, and, and so we basically have looked at, can we repurpose these cells? So these cells that are in the bloodstream can we gene engineer them in such a way that when they go back, they can actually kill the original tumor? And then we put a kill switch in the, in the circulating tumor cells to kill those cells. So here is a very you know, detailed plan of what we think. So let's assume a patient has first surgery. We take the tumor cells. It's therapy sensitive we actually CRISPR gene added the receptors on the surface of the cell so they become resistant to the therapy. Then we engineer them with the therapeutic that we want to kill that they are therapy sensitive to and then also kill switch. And we go back into this tumor and what happens is that these tumor cells will be killed um, and then you can actually kill the gene engineered cells with the kill switch. Um, so here is a little schematic. So for example, we took an example of TRAIL. TRAIL binds to two receptors, DR4 and DR5. If you knock out um, with CRISPR-Cas9 two receptors, and then and the cells will become resistant to TRAIL, and then we'll have a kill switch in there, and we can actually kill the original cells, and then kill these cells with a kill switch. So we, we did that, we um, gene edited cells um, and showed that if you knock out one receptor, DR4, then cells become half resistant. And if you knock out both receptors, um, cells become fully resistant to trail and you can then um, engineer them to express trail and, and TK, it's a kill switch. We've done this for brain, for prostate cancer, colon, T cell lymphomas, um, GBMs and, and breast cancer metastases. And we show again here, the, the red are the original cells, the green are the gene edited cells, the gene edited cells can kill the, the red cells. And if you now place these green cells, these are gene edited cells in the gel, in the resection for resection, this is all in culture, they can kill the red cells because the therapeutics are released by green cells and they kill the, the red cells. And then we've shown this with in vivo imaging as well, and in in um, in a mouse model, we can actually get huge survival benefit. So we're now looking at the immune uh, aspect of this. Can we do this in immune setting? Of course, we'll not be able to use trail because mouse cells do not have trail receptors. Can we use other therapeutics that uh, we can gene engineer these cells? Um, gene edit first and then gene engineer these cells and that can be killing. So possibly we will have a, a big study coming out at the end of the year um, on, on this technology with, uh, with in immune competent settings uh, and more of an immune therapeutic vaccine approach. So I want to summarize this, um, in, as I told you that cell-based targeted therapies have an enormous potential um, to be translated in the clinics. Um, and there are certain bottlenecks. I think delivery is definitely a bottleneck. Uh, um, tumor models, um, preclinical models are essential because uh, there are lots of therapies, um, lots of trials that go to phase one from basic preclinical studies, but only two, one to 2% end up in phase three. 
and then very few out of those phase three get approved. So I think there is something wrong somewhere between the preclinical studies and the phase one studies, which we're not actually um, looking at carefully. And then um, one more thing is that, you know, you have to understand current treatment regimen because if you go with your cell-based therapy in the phase one will always be working with um, what is what the patient is currently being treated with. That's chemozolomide and chemo and uh, chemo and radiation. And we should always bring that into our uh, bring that into our uh, um, into our therapeutic model system. Um, so I want to leave you with uh, with a quote from Rumi um, that actually defines that uh, how work and as a worker, if both of them exist in you, um, you will find joy. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. So I'm going to now invite uh, with your permission, I'm going to invite the floor to ask you any questions they have. Okay. So, uh, do feel free to ask Mr. Shah any questions you have throughout the presentation. It's very comprehensive and very clear even I was following it well. Uh, so I would like to encourage the floor to write in, either you raise your hand and I will unmute you, or you can write your questions in coming in Q and A box, or you can write to drop your questions on the chat box as well. So don't be shy. Or Mr. Khaled, um, we like to share a couple of takeaways while um, the participants are warming up. Yeah, please. Um, you know, as I said in, in my summary, that you know we are at the cusp of something that um, not only us are innovating, but the whole field of uh, cell and gene therapy are innovating. The key bottlenecks are how are we going to translate these therapies. I think we all have to be thinking, um, you know, proactively when we when we do these things in the lab, run experiments in the lab. What is the outcome of these experiments? And 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 I think um, if we have had any success, it's basically whenever we design any basic uh, research or or hypothesize anything, and the patient is always in the back of the mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, if I may ask you a question, um, it, it, uh, it's not to deliberately sound, come across as insensitive. Now, I mean, now with the pandemic, uh, how, how are you, is your research got to do, uh, prioritize the research? Because a lot of focus is now, I, I have seen a lot of news, and a lot of um, medical executives having their focus now on the COVID, uh, not so much on other patients. Uh, what's your take on that? Uh, yeah, I think we, we have to be careful that not everybody gets into COVID research because, uh, you know, we all come up with a certain expertise. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if everybody jumps into COVID research, um, uh, I don't that is a great idea. Uh, of course, I think we should give it to people who have the expertise in the COVID research field. And I mean, there's a lot to still ponder on in, in the field that we are in. And even just getting the thought process right, writing the grants and, and you know, communicating with different folks. I mean, there's still a lot to do. I mean, it's not, uh, I don't anticipate that uh, like we are opening, you know, starting to open um, hopefully next week. Um, so I think, uh, although it will not be the same um, norm as it used to be, 
uh, it will have to be altered. Um, it will be altered um, that I think there will be shifts you will have to come, but I think you should be able to focus on your work. Uh, my suggestion to people is that please not everybody should jump into COVID research. Let people who have the certain expertise um, know what they're doing, let them do it. And if they need support from you and need, need to collaborate with you, they will reach out. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can see we have a relatively shy group of participants today. Uh, how about this, uh, Mr. Shah, what we can do is to send an email to have the attendees to um, put in their thoughts, because uh, I must say the presentation is very comprehensive. So like, what I can do is to have them to put in their thoughts and direct all the emails to you. Of course, um, after we Keynotion does the compiling, would that be okay for you? Yeah, that's fine. If there's a single email, you can compile all the questions. Mm -hmm. That would be great. All right, great. Thank you for joining us this evening. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today. Uh, in this case, feel free to drop your email to Keynotion, and we will uh, redirect them to Mr. Shah to uh, all the to answer any doubts you have during the presentation. So once again, Mr. Shah, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to host you. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to hosting you again. Yeah, take care. Thank you, you for too. inviting me. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.